Right then, so, um, first of all, my name's Ed Courtney, I'm a technical architect and evangelist working for a large manufacturer retailer in the southwest of England. I can't tell exactly who they are, but those of you who know me will know who they are. Um, I've been a developer, programmer, dog's body, what have you, for about 25 years plus. Um, I know there are people who will have much more experience than I have. I'm not a, there's no appeal to, to authority here, um, but I have been around a bit, so I have seen a few things. Um, so that was one of the very first machines I ever worked on. Yeah, there's a few appreciative nods around before migrating to one of these. No? No? No BBC Micro fans in the audience? Wasn't rich enough. Wasn't rich enough. <laughs> I got mine very, very cheap, very second hand. Um, before migrating to one of these lovely machines. Um, and, and, and then the, the, the eventual upgrade to that. <laughs> so, okay. Um, I'm a very, very, very infrequent, infrequent blogger. You will find my website there. Um, it will, the tumbleweed will buzz across it regularly. Um, I'll go through spurts where there'll be two or three posts in a row, and then there'll be nothing for about a year. So um, don't worry about it. But if, if there's anything you find that it's useful, knock yourself out, but I don't expect it to be. So just so I can get a general feel for the audience, who here has used TypeScript before? A couple. Brilliant. OK. How many of you are regular JavaScript developers? OK. How many of you run teams with JavaScript developers or people who write? OK. Good. OK. So. What is TypeScript? TypeScript itself is a superset of JavaScript. It's there to solve the problems, some of the problems that, type, that, that JavaScript has with development. Now, JavaScript on its own, in a, as, a, as a browser language, is fantastic. It solves many, many problems and has survived because, pri primarily because it is very good and very fast at what it does. The problem is that as the world has gone on, as applications have become more um, complex, as we do more and more stuff in our browsers, trying to maintain especially large-scale application development where you're supporting huge chunks of this in your browser has become more and more difficult to maintain. And one of the problems is the very strength of JavaScript. JavaScript itself is a, is, a, is, a, is a typeless language. It's expando. You can throw anything into an object at any time. You can, uh, the shape of an object can change, which has its advantages, but it also has major disadvantages, especially when you're working with large teams. And this becomes more and more of a theme as you go on with large-scale developments. So we um, are work primarily, I work primarily with a team that deals with um, a large-scale e-commerce system for example. So we have four or five developers who will do nothing but front-end work. And they will all have their own separate parceled off bits of work that they deal with in the browser. Okay? Now, the bit, individual bits of work that they deal with in the browser will all have JavaScript tests. They'll, all help, they'll be running JUnit. They'll be doing stuff at the front-end. But unlike the back-end, which may well be .NET or maybe Java, there's no contracts to enforce. There's nothing to say, this is the object that I expect to see at this point. So this, this block of code is going to produce me a result, and it's going to look like something that this block of code over here can deal with. OK? So this is, one that, so this is the main driver behind TypeScript. And so it gives it its name as well. So it's effectively a types version of JavaScript. Now, it follows its cues from ECMAScript 6. Um, now what I mean by that is it introduces quite a lot of features that are slated for um, ECMAScript 6 or JavaScript 6. Um, so things like classes, 
So anybody who's seen the specs for JavaScript 6 will instantly recognize a lot of the features that get produced in, in TypeScript. And TypeScript itself will then compile back to JavaScript 5 compliant code or even JavaScript, JavaScript 3 compliant code if you really need to, but then you lose some functionality. Okay. So as I say, the compilation target is JavaScript. What you get out of it at the other end is pure vanilla JavaScript that should work in any environment. So TypeScript in at one end, JavaScript out at the other end. Okay? Now this sort of idea has been gaining traction quite a lot recently. I mean, that we're quite used to the idea now of people not producing CSS files on their own. Teams will quite often have SAS or less components that will produce the output. Okay? So even though the, it's still a bit of an odd concept for a lot of people that you're going to produce, your, your output is JavaScript, um, it's, it shouldn't be seen, it, 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 it's, not a, it's not that, a, not that foreign an idea. Okay? Everyone with me so far? Excellent. It is also free and open source. Now this is a very, um, <laughs> this is a departure for Microsoft. Um, but there it is. There is the Git repository for TypeScript. You are welcome to go to it at any point. You can check out the entire source code. You've got the entire commit history. They are, in fact, even accepting pull requests. Of only, only very, very few of them, but they are accepting them. So um, it's worth having a peruse around, actually. It's, it's, a, it's a fascinating code base. But anyway. So why TypeScript? Why not something else? Why not something like CoffeeScript? And, and this is not, before I go any further, this is not having a go at CoffeeScript, OK? This is not having a go, it's not a particular thing I'm picking on. There are any number of solutions in this space. So there are any number of things that will take an, take an input and produce JavaScript at the back end as a result that you can then use, yes? Um, but CoffeeScript is a good example because CoffeeScript has been around for a while. Okay, so when you consider TypeScript, well, TypeScript is a superset of JavaScript, so it's familiar. It has that familiarity around it. It does have some interchangeability to it. Uh, but it's immature, and I make no bones about this. It is immature. It's only hit the version one release earlier this year. So. It's been around in a beta, but it's been around since uh, there was a working 0.8 release, I think it was last year. Um, or the year before, I can't remember now. Um, but it is fairly immature. So the, the version 1 standard isn't, isn't that old. Um, and it can be verbose. So one of the nice things about JavaScript is it's nice and terse. So you can just quickly say, say what you want to do and move on. You can get into situations with TypeScript where you do have to be more verbose about what you're doing. You do have to sometimes have to put some more effort into explaining what's the concept of, your, of, your, of, of the signature um, or an interface might look like. And I'll come on to things like that in a bit. Whereas something like CoffeeScript, well, CoffeeScript, its main problem is it's a new language. And a lot of these things are new languages. So if you look at CoffeeScript or you look at LiveScript or you look at um, any number of these solutions, they don't look like the JavaScript that developers know and love. If you think about the reason why something like Less or something like SAS has taken off and is now regularly used by front-end developers, one of the major reasons I would contend is that it looks like its target. It looks like CSS. A developer who is familiar with CSS is able to take, pick up SAS or Less very quickly, because they don't have that much extra learning to do. Yes? It's familiar to them. In most cases, especially with things like less, you can rename the file. So you can take a CSS file and you can rename it to .less and run it. And run it through the process. Okay? Now, with something like CoffeeScript, that isn't going to happen. The other thing... But the other thing in CoffeeScript's favor is it is well established. I mean, it has been around for a couple of years. There is a very, very large and thriving community of CoffeeScript developers. If you have a code base in CoffeeScript, you will find people out there, not as many, but you will find people out there who will be able to support your, um, support your code base for you. 
And it has a really nice terse syntax. It's very, very small. It's very tight. It allows you to express think what you want to express in very, very short terms. So, for example, that. Now, to, most to a lot of developers, that's brilliant. That's really nice. That shows you exactly what you want it to do. You've got a button, there's a click, and there's, there's a single arrow that goes to a set timeout function, which, hang on, there's a fat arrow. What's the difference between a single arrow and a fat arrow? Um, oh, hang on, what's that? You see, to a lot of people, that's scary. Okay? Now, I'm not suggesting for a moment that if you spend the time and you learn TypeScript and you get proficient with it, you can be very, very proficient with it. And I know people who are. But the problem you've got is, especially if you've got a team of developers, you've, especially if you've got people who are comfortable in the JavaScript world, all right? So we, got, we quite often get this. We got, I quite, I've been in situations where we inherit people from, let's say, a design department or a design function who'll then be moved over into a development function to help to aid developers, right? And they know JavaScript because they've been doing stuff at the front end. They've been animating things with jQuery. They've been, work, they've been doing stuff that, at, at that level. They don't want to learn another language. Right? But what we want from them is code that we know that we can support. So I think this is where, and I think this, I mean, I've used it in situations, and I think it's validated it for me. <laughs> but this is what TypeScript allows us to do. This is what TypeScript gives us. Okay? It allows people to come in and do the work that they want them to do at the browser end, maybe. Um, but it then gives security to the developers, for example. Now, not everybody agrees with me on this. Douglas Crockford, who I admire usually, and I'm not, I'm, I am not going to turn around and say he's wrong. He's wrong. But <laughs> Douglas Crockford um, thinks that uh, TypeScript is overrated. Uh, I tend to disagree. I really do. Um, but hey, I, I'm not going to argue. The TypeScript is not a panacea. It is not going to solve all your problems for you. You can write bad code in any framework you like. You can write bad code in COBOL. You can write it in C Sharp. You can write it in JavaScript. You can just as easily write it in TypeScript. It is not going to solve fundamental coding problems for you. It does, however, rip out a whole class of errors and a whole class of de developer problems that, uh, that, 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 that wouldn't uh, otherwise exist. OK? Everyone with me so far? Brilliant. OK. So what does it look like? OK, so this is very, sim this is very simple. This is simple JavaScript code. What have we got here? We've got a declaration, and we've, we're saying that n is uh, what? It's a number. b is boolean, and s is a string. There's TypeScript. There's N, there's B, and there's S. Now, in fact, TypeScript doesn't even need the type annotations at this point, because we've told TypeScript, if, we, if we're using TypeScript at this point, we're saying that N is 0, therefore N has to be a number. So it will assume the type of a number. B has to be Boolean. It can't be anything else. Therefore, it will assume that type. If, however, you're doing, a you're doing a declaration and you're not providing a value, then you can just simply say what the type is. So in all cases in TypeScript, the declaration follows as a colon behind the name. So it's var n colon number. So I could take the equal zero out. The system would then know it's a number that I'm dealing with. OK? There is a special kind of... Um, uh, uh, of uh, a type. So in this case, what is A? Anonymous? It, any. There you go. <laughs> it's any. So there is a special type in JavaScript called any. Uh, sorry, in TypeScript called any. And this just says that, look, we don't know what's going to go in here. The shape of this object could be anything. So there may well be times when you need to do this. There may well be times when you have a function that returns multiple, multiple types depending on the input. Now, there are ways around this, and I'll try and come on to it. But in this case, you can declare things as being any. 
It is generally discouraged, if at all possible. Try not to, because one of the powers, powers of TypeScript is that you don't have to do this. But there are times when it's useful. It also adds various things. So, for example, an enum. Now, enumerations don't exist in JavaScript. Okay? So, sometimes you'll find, so, as I say, there is no direct analog for this in ECMAScript. There's no analog for this in ECMAScript 6 either. Okay? However, it will produce code for you. So, not only will it enforce typing on your code, it will then do generative code as well. But it does it in such a way that it's nice and clean and doesn't affect other things. You'll notice here, here it's actually declared a, uh, it's declared a var, and it's, put, it's got a function that takes that var and is adding some features to it. So in this case, it's, a, it's actually adding properties, and it's adding that the, color, that the string red is equal to zero. And in fact, you can, get back to the, you can get back to the string from the value as well. That's really quite nice. And we've got, um, yes, and so functions. So the types on functions. So in this case, I have a varo, and I'm saying it contains a foo function. And this foo function takes two parameters, x and y, that are both numbers. Okay? And it's going to return the result. Now, you'll notice that I haven't put a type, a return type, on the foo, fun on the foo function. So I have no, sorry, I have no return type specified. And the reason is that it can infer it. If I've got two numbers coming in and I'm adding the two numbers together, the only result I can possibly get is a number. So it will infer that the return type of foo is a number. In fact, if I go to... Now, I would strongly recommend that one of the things you do at some point is go and have a look at this. This is the TypeScript Playground. And the TypeScript Playground is... Live is in the browser. Um, this is written in TypeScript and hosts TypeScript inside in real time. So you can play along if you want. <laughs> so if I say I've got varo, OK, and I'm going to say varo contains a function Now, I deliberately haven't put any type information in here, here yet. Now, when I type mouse over, can you see this? It says that varo is an object that has a shape. And that shape is, it has a member, foo, that's a function that takes x and y, and these are any. So these are any types. I haven't given it a clue as to what these types are, right? And it's going to return any. So that's the shape of my object. I can then change this so I can say that I want this to be a number and that to be a number. And now if I look at this, the signature's changed. So, the, so foo has now changed from being x of any, so this is now x of number, y of number, and the return type is a number. Okay. The simple upshot of this is that if I have O and I've got foo and I try and do A and B, it's not going to let me. It's going to say that it can't select an overload. Now, that's perfectly legal JavaScript. On the right-hand side, that is perfectly legal. Okay? Yes. Yes. But for whatever reason, it never really would do in real life had it returned a different type. Yes. Um, would it then just infer that you're returning an error? 
Can I come back to that? Uh, th sorry, uh, th the question was, if you've got multiple return types, return different type objects, would it infer any? Um, yes, on the whole, but there are scenarios where, th where you actually want this to happen, um, and there are ways of describing it. Um, so, for example, if you create an element in the doc uh, document create element, if you think about what comes back from that. But we'll come back to that. Okay. All right, so everyone with me so far? Okay, so this, this is perfectly valid JavaScript, but it's not, but the point is it wasn't the intention. The intention was never to allow somebody to add two strings together. The intention of foo, for whatever it is, is that it, you want it to add two numbers together, not strings. Okay, now, as it stands, I could quite easily call foo and put two strings together and join them, but that's not what the intent is. Okay, so what this allows you to do is it allows you to describe much better what the intent is. Um, there is also the, this fat arrow rep representation of a function. Um, so I could simplify things at this point, and I could say that I want to say that foo is number, y is a number, and I'm simply going to fat arrow this. So I'm going to give, give it a lambda. which ties in nicely with uh, what, was saying, what was being said this morning. Hang on, what have I done wrong there? Oh, okay. I haven't done anything wrong. It's, it is, again, telling me that it doesn't want me to allow two strings. But if I put in two values, there you go. It's, now got, it's going to allow it through. Okay? So pretty much everything that follows on is a variation on this theme. But it allows you, um, it, it, so yes, it allows, it allows you to express more and more complicated things, but within the same sort of thing, okay? So, it's, it's a yes? Number, not an integer. There are no integers in JavaScript. Right. JavaScript only has arrays, and then numbers, strings, and booleans and then objects that are extended. But no, there is no concept of, a, of, of an integer in JavaScript. Um, that caught me out so, several times. <laughs> so, as I say, given that, um, uh, given that block of, of TypeScript, that is what you'll be produced at the other end. The other thing to notice whenever you do this is it's type erasure everywhere. There is no type information ever exposed in the JavaScript that's produced at the other end. So that issue I was showing you just now where x and y could take strings, that doesn't stop this problem when you're calling the generated code from another bit of JavaScript. There's nothing to stop you breaking the rules again. Okay? Where this helps is where you call it from other TypeScript generated code. Because other TypeScript generated code will take a look at this and go, but hang on, that's not the intent. Okay? The, ex the exported JavaScript might look this way. Yes? So it's, it's not going to stop everything. So if you produce JavaScript from TypeScript and you consume it from within JavaScript, it's not going to stop any of this behavior happening. OK? So pop quiz, what does this do? In JavaScript, if I was to run this in JavaScript right now, what would the value of t be? Yes? It would be hello undefined. How many people know that parameters in JavaScript are optional? A few. Not everyone. And I it would not surprise you to learn that I've, been, I've seen many developers who had no idea. In fact, many of the, our favorite JavaScript libraries work on that principle. jQuery has numerous occasions where parameters are optional and will behave differently depending on what parameters you pass in. So that may or may not be a problem. But that's certainly not what the intent is. Again, let's go back to intent. This isn't going to stop the errors where people force things in. But the intent is clearly not, of this function, is clearly not to ha have b as an optional parameter, is it? The intent is quite clear that you, what you actually want to do is, is, is to add the two together. Now, what are you wanting your, uh, your developers to do? So 
are you wanting them to have to trawl through every function that they call to make sure that the parameters that they're passing in are optional or not? Well, obviously not. So one of the nice things that TypeScript does is it gives us optional parameters. OK, so if you notice on our function now, I've got a concat function. And, all, and just behind the definition, or just behind B, before the colon, there's a question mark. Now, it does nothing to the output. It does absolutely nothing to the output, and I'll prove this again. So if we go back to uh, our playground, OK? So we've got a function, we call it concat. It's going to take A and B as strings. So it's going to take a string, and B is going to be an optional string. OK? And it's going to, sorry, Mr. Comma, there we go. So if B return A plus B, otherwise it will simply return return A. Ah, can't type. These chiclet keyboards, you know, they're, just, they're brilliant. <laughs> so, notice on the function that's been emitted on the right-hand side, so in our generated JavaScript, there is no mention of B being an optional parameter. But anybody calling this from within TypeScript, so anyone where the, anywhere where the IntelliSense is there, will now immediately know that that's the case. Because if I now call concat... There we go. It's there in the IntelliSense. OK? So it will allow me to be able to do this. Now, if I say, hello, world, that's fine. Now, you see, if I take, if I take one parameter out, that's fine. If I take that off, I've now immediately got an error. OK? So it's a class of errors that you could, is quite common. I've seen this several times. And this helps to solve them. OK? Any questions on that? No? In much the same way, it will provide default parameters for you. So if, if, you've, it's a basic, if you've got a, 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 an optional parameter, but, or, or if, if the parameter hasn't been supplied, you actually want to use a different value, OK, there is a signature for this. And this produces that, in which case I can get rid of everything else apart from that. OK. So it will produce code that checks to see whether the parameter has been provided. If it hasn't been provided, it will provide it for you, and it will provide it with the value that you specified in the signature. OK? So again, it's, it's, not, it, you know, it's not major. It's not, it's not earth shattering. It's not going to solve world hunger or you know, bring about peace or anything else. However, it might stop a few arguments between your developers and, and your project managers. So interfaces, you'll come at, this is where the fun starts. I told you, it does get fun. Interfaces, these are, I've seen the, the interfaces described as the Swiss army knife of TypeScript. These interfaces pretty much cover everything. So they help describe objects. They can help describe indexable objects. They can ensure the class instance shape. OK? And they are completely erased during compilation. So in the cases where we've seen before, in the functions that we've been dealing with, all the type information that we had at, compi at, at compile time is erased. OK? Exactly the same thing happens with interfaces. But interfaces help you describe things in a more global way. So it allows you to say, here is a, here is a shape 
that I'm going to uh, I, I want objects to adhere to, or here's a shape that I'm uh, I'm going to uh, I'm going to assume something a parameter that's going to be passed in adheres to. So you can do various things with it. You can describe functions, for example. So here we have an interface that I'm calling I operator func. An I operator func is describing a function that takes two parameters, num1 and num2, and produces a number as a result. OK? This should look very familiar to most Java or most C-sharp developers. OK? There's nothing scary about this. And so if you look at this, I operator func describes this function here, add. So what I've said is I have a variable add. And the type I've assigned to it, or the type that I'm saying that this is, is I operator func. And I'm assigning to that variable a function. And that function takes a number and a number and returns the two numbers added together. OK? So it just as equally describes the subtract method. So again, I have a subtract method, and that subtract method is a function that takes a number and a number and returns the difference between the two. Yeah? So I could now say that I have a, var, a, 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 a variable called exec. Now this takes a function which actually takes an I operator func and takes two numbers. And this returns the operation. So this allows, so this, think of this as a way of describing a type, say, function pointer, for example. Yes? So if you look at the bottom line there, I can call exec with add and two values, and I will get the result. So I can pass in that variable, which just happens to be a, happens to be a function, and execute it. Does that make sense to everyone? Yes? Nothing scary so far. OK. So I could reduce this. I don't have to use the, the, the more verbose function declarations at this point. I could actually just use a fat error. I could use, use, just use lambdas. So again, it's exactly the same thing. The operator func, the, the, the signature hasn't changed. OK. I'm still saying that operator func takes two values, both numbers, and produces the values at the other and produces a number at the other end. And because of type inference, x plus y, we know that x plus y is a number. We also know that x minus y is a number, except in the cases when it isn't. Um, <laughs> so, um, but there you go. OK? And so I can still call so the operator x and y against exactly at the, at the end there. OK? I could even do this. So notice the interface hasn't changed. In all of these cases, I haven't changed the interface. The I operator func stays the same all the way through this. So in this case, I've only got the interface declaration, and I've got the ex execute declaration, and I'm now saying that I have, I'm going to execute a function. Now I'm casting the type here to I operator func, and it's going to return the, uh, return the addition, and there are the values I'm passing in. Now, the cast I don't need. So th that, is all I, th that is all I need to provide, because that function, x and y, that returns x plus y, matches the shape of I operator func. It fulfills it completely, right? So even though that function is declared down the bottom there with no mention of I operator func, it's still compatible. And TypeScript will still allow that through, and it will still compile it. OK? So that, 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 those, the implementations I could describe in these ways. I could implement them in these ways. I could add, I, I could say I've got var add. And I'm saying there's the function, uh, and I'm going to cast it to I operator func. Now, if I didn't put that cast in there, 
um, it wouldn't know that it wouldn't take the, um, the, the X and Y's numbers. It would just simply be a function that takes any's. Okay, so it would be ta X takes any, Y takes any, and returns any. Or I've got the var add, where I'm to uh, say var add is of I, I operator func, and again I'm returning the function that way. Or I'm just simply being verbose about the types that are being passed in. But they all mean the same thing. They are all compatible. They can all be, they can all be passed in where anything is saying, I want an I operator func, given the, uh, given the interface that I've declared, they're all compatible. So this is type compatibility. And uh, I mean, who's, who's heard of duck typing? Yes, a couple of people. The name duck typing, for those of you who don't know, Duck typing comes from the saying that if it looks like a duck, walks like a duck, quacks like a duck, it's a duck. So if your type, <laughs> seriously, if your type contains the values that you want, it is, the, it is that type. So in this case, if I've got foo and bar, right? Foo and bar have, uh, foo has two members, right? One's an ID that's a number, one's a name that's a string. Bar has three. It's got an ID that's a number, it's a name that's a string, and it has an is populated that is Boolean. Now, even though I have no, um, I, I have no um, relationship explicitly defined between foo and bar, the fact that bar contains ID and name of the same types that foo contains means that, boo, uh, that, that, that bar, sorry, anything that is, that is a bar could be passed into anything that requires a foo. Right? because it has the same shape. For all the things that foo has, bar has. However, it is not true the other way around. I cannot now take anything, that, I can't take any function that's declared that says, I want, a bill, uh, I want a bar object and put a foo into it. Yes? Um, da, 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 da. No, the, no, the target would then have to be, you would, the, the the the, um, the bar would have to say that it's that, uh, um, that it would still need optionals on either end, okay? Because you're saying that look, I, the, the may or may not be a value here, okay? Um, but that's in, but so. Types are compatible based on the structure of the types. So it's not down to names. It's not actually down to inheritance. It's not down to anything else. It is simply the structures. Are the structures compatible? If they are, we're going to let them through. OK? It's basically, is duck typing done right? And this is one of the very few cases where I've actually seen duck typing done really well. Mainly because it's something that's been forced on it by JavaScript. Because JavaScript has no idea what these types are, and never will do. <laughs> by the time you compile it down, these types won't exist. OK. So another little, couple of little funky things that you get. Um, so rest parameters. So in the cases where you have a multiple, um, say you have um, uh, multiple parameters that you want to treat as an array, you simply prefix the name with, th with an ellipsis with three dots. It must be the very last thing that you do. But it's still typable, so we can still say in this case, so I've got two display name, I've got a first name I'm taking as a string, last name I'm taking as a string, and then the other names as, an, as a string array. Okay? So again, this isn't going to allow me to put Fred blogs one, two, three. Okay? And in this case, I'm simply saying, I'm going to take the take, take, uh, names, I'm going to make an array using the first name as the first item. And they're going to for each over the other names. I, I'm making no claims that this is going to be efficient code. This is really seriously inefficient code. You never write this in the real world. If this goes through code review, it's being rejected. But this is just to prove a point. Um, so I'm just going to for each over. I'm passing a lambda in that pushes each name onto, a, onto the list. And then push the last name. And then I'm just simply going to join them using spaces. So it's going to produce, it would produce for me you know, Andy Q. Jones if you wanted to. All right? And this produces this. So it takes away all the drudgery of having to deal with trying to grab arg arguments off the end. It just does it for you. 
Okay, so this is all perfectly possible. You can do this. You could write this by hand now. It just takes that. Just, just takes it away from me. And it's also there's, there is a class of there, there is a class of of errors that very easily creep in here, where if you've said previously, um, say you've got first name, and you say other names, first of all, uh, and then later on you add in last name as a as the second parameter. Uh, it's very easy to miss the fact that you have to change your for loop to pick up, the, to, to move the index at which point you're picking up the, the other parameters. Very, very easy to do. I've seen that one done many times before. Okay. So again, this is just one of those class of errors you can pretty much, you can pretty much wipe out by using this sort of function. So classes in TypeScript. Well, so classes in TypeScript are effectively ECMAScript 6 classes. Uh, anybody who's read any of the ECMAScript 6, I'll put my teeth in again. Anybody who's used <laughs> the ECMAScript 6 class uh, conventions will immediately recognize this. The only real difference is that it includes the optional type of annotations. And sometimes the annotations are not optional, but in most cases, it is that they are pretty much the same thing. So, in one of the um, canonical references I found for ECMAScript 6, this is uh, this was a this was a canonical example of a class in ECMAScript 6. Okay, so you have a class that's called car. There is a constructor that takes a make. Um, it's immediately assigning a variable, an internal class variable, right, a field called make, this.make, to the value that's been passed in. It's also making a new class variable called uh, current speed and assigning it the value of 25. Okay? There is nothing scary about this at all. Is there? Is there? No? Good. We're all on the same page. <laughs> so the only real thing, the only difference you would have to do to make this compatible with TypeScript, uh, as it currently stands, is to do that. And that is to tell it what the field types are. So tell it that make, that you basically you've just got to tell it that you want two field, type, uh, field values, right, field variables. And we're going to say we've got one called make and we've got one called current speed. Obviously, we give it the types. So we've now got our type safety, OK? And that's pretty much it. Now, you can go further than this. You can say that, actually, there's a bit of noise here that I don't really need to see. There's um, the make that's being passed in. Okay, I'm ref I'm, I've, got a, I've got the field, value, field variable, I mean, sorry, called, which I'm defining up there. And I'm passing it in and I'm assigning. To be honest, I don't need to see this. If I simply say that... Does that mean you can use classes and browsers that don't support the MCA6? Absolutely. Absolutely. I was going to come on to this. <laughs> right. So, this will compile, back compile to ECMAScript. <laughs> Again, the teeth, I'm sorry. ECMAScript 5. Uh, or, in fact, even ECMAScript 3, I believe. But uh, the default nowadays is ECMAScript 5, so therefore, this is what we'll what be using. Anyway, yes. But I'll just quickly run through this. So, what this is saying is... The value that's being passed in, or the, the uh, constructor parameter, make, with the, pr with the public attributes on it, um, make a, 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 it will define a field value and assign it there and then. And it says that it's publicly available. Now, as with everything in JavaScript, there is no public and private. There just isn't. However, uh, you can still give things the, the, the concept of public and private in, in TypeScript. So sometimes you might want to say, look, I don't touch this. This is something I actually need to use internally in my class. I don't really want you touching this. So TypeScript will stop you. But again, in the same situation like we had earlier, the generated JavaScript has, will, won't have any traps around it. Okay? But yes, so let's go and do this thing. So let's say we have a, a class. 
It's a car. Okay. And we'll give it a constructor. So, first of all, I'm just going to show this is what it will produce. Okay? So there is car. Is there Say again? Aha. Uh -huh. You're way ahead of me. <laughs> yes, but we'll come to it. Okay. So if we say that there is, so there is the car. Now if I say that I want a public make, and I say that's going to be a string. You'll see that it has assigned the local uh, a, a local field um, a, 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 a local field called make to the value make. Okay, it's already done for me. So any time that I now say I've got var car is equal to new car, and this new car is a um, I don't know Mustang. Okay. That car has a make that is visible to me. Okay? I could turn around and say, I want this to be private. Notice that there is no difference. There is absolutely zero difference in the emitted JavaScript. However, from a TypeScript perspective, if I now have a look at this, there is no, there shouldn't be, a, a, the, the make should not be visible. In fact, it isn't. It now, it now gives me an error. All right, car.make isn't accessible. Okay? There are, you just have to remember that not everybody will be using TypeScript at the other end, but those are the people that are. This is one of the reasons why it's useful to keep, to, to, to keep the stack at this level, right? Because then you do get this, you, you do get these, these, these fail saves. So um, I could say that. Let's go back to, what did I have there? Yes. And if I say that we have a, I'll sort of make that public again, and we'll say that there is a current speed. So um, a public speed, and we'll say there's a number. So again, there is the, there is the assignment there. Okay. And I could say is speeding, and I'll, I could say that uh, let's say that the speed limit is seventy. So there we go, and I will return a boolean. Sorry, what am I doing? Ah. Sorry, ah, I can't type. <laughs> so this speed is greater than our speed limit. There we go. So you see, it's already, it's already asserted that it is returning a Boolean. I haven't told that, I need to tell it that that's the case because the result of this operation has to be brilliant. Okay? So, there is my class. And I could say, var car, for new car. Sorry. Mustang, it is definitely going, it is going 80 miles an hour. And so if I was to console log uh, car dot is speeding bosh now that would obviously be true the, the default um, accessibility uh, public for public for everywhere because basically that is the default accessibility in JavaScript so, so you can leave public out of the TypeScript drive absolutely Absolutely. But as I, say, as, I, as I say, even if I turn around and say that's private, right? Yeah, it makes no difference. It makes no difference. So, to be honest, uh, pu pu public, uh, pu public and private are only really 
pointers to your end users to say, you know, hands off. Yeah, but much like, much the same with most languages, even C sharp, for example. You know, even if something is marked as being private, there are ways around it. Right, you, Yes. Mm -hmm. Right. I'll, I'll come to that. There are right. So, so, so compiling to underscore directly? No, no. There are it, its target is JavaScript, yeah. um, and there are some module loaders that it understands. Uh, I will come to that hopefully. Yeah, I've got plenty of time. Um, but, but no. Uh, so, so, so no. Targeting underscore directly? No. But uh, using utilizing other libraries? Yes. Yes. There's no reason why you. Sorry. So the question. So the question at the back there for the camera is that when you compile, can you obfuscate? Um, there's nothing to stop you obfuscating. There really isn't. You, if you want to minify after the compilation process, absolutely. Um, so you'll notice here that the, the, the JavaScript that's produced, wherever possible, it will wrap things within the methods. Okay. So as much as physically possible. Most com most com uh, compressors will, will uh, obfuscators will, will do quite a good job of that. That's not what this would do. So there is nothing to stop you chaining the output. So you could have your TypeScript compiler produce JavaScript, and then you have another another operation in the chain to take that JavaScript and then and further move on. Okay, uh, but no, it doesn't deal with that directly. Okay, yeah, brilliant. Yes. Aha! Again, we might we, we might see this a bit later on. There's a recurring theme going on here. <laughs> okay, so yes, I was asked about inheritance, and yes, there is inheritance in uh, the classes that are produced. Okay, so if I was to say that there is a new class, right, I will call this a Hummer that extends car, right. Look what it's automatically produced. So all of a sudden, it's produced all the wiring, all the wiring uh, required to take the car, and there's the Hummer that extends our car. OK? It's all done for you. No. No, there's no, there's no concept of protected. There's no concept. You have to remember, JavaScript has no concept of protected, has no concept of anything else. Okay, so you are, the, the, there's very little point in them putting stuff in that the, 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 you know. Um, okay. So yes, I can now say I could now say that um, you know um, I could say that this I could over, I, override is speeding, um, you know, and you know, are you kidding? This is a hammer. You know, spend a f small fortune in fuel, um, <laughs> but anyway, d does, does that does that make sense? Okay. So obviously, anything that then takes a car will then accept will then accept a Hummer as a as a, a parameter, because it is a car. Okay. We'll come. I, I'm I'm not glossing over this. We'll 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 get back to some of this a bit in a bit more detail in a minute. Okay. So. Generics. There is a, a, a TypeScript, I think it was 0.9, introduced generics as a concept. Again, generics, like everything else, generics is erasure. So all type information at the point of uh, uh, post compilation will have, been, will have gone. But let's take this, for, uh, this function for an example. So this function, called add length, takes two objects, x and y. And the shape of these objects means that both x and y, amongst other things, will have a length property. So, they, so x and y may well have other properties. They may well have other things to them. It's not, they don't just contain length, and, uh, length as numbers, but that's the minimum that they, they must have. OK? 
and it's just simply going to return the addition of the lengths. OK? So here we have two objects. We've got foo and bar. They have both got properties on them of, of type. Uh, of uh, they've both got numbers. One's 10 and one's 15. And so it won't take you, it won't take a genius to say that the result would be 25. Now, what I could say here is I want an interface. I'm going to say I have an interface that I'm going to call I length. And that interface contains a length that is a number. With me? Now I've changed my function to say that x and y just need to be of that interface type. OK? And I'm going to return the addition again. Now notice something interesting here. Foo and bar, again, have, no, have nothing on them to say that they are i lengths. But they just happen to have lengths defined on them. They're not even the same type. OK? So when I go and do this, the same thing happens. So I'm saying I have an add length of t. And t extends i length. And x and y are both of type t. Therefore, we know that, t, that type t has a length. And I can add the two together. All right? Now, again, t extends i length, even though x and y are clearly not the same type. They're clearly not, because they're completely different definitions. Right? They just, they're just objects that happen to have the right shape. That then works. In fact, I could even go as far as to take the interface out completely. And I could say that t extends the shape. OK? They all, every single one of them, produce that output. Every single version. In all cases, we have a function that takes x and y and adds the length. Right. Now, obviously, in this case, it does go to show function, uh, 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 functional gener function generics are slightly pointless. Um, however, you can do generic classes, which are a bit more interesting. Again, I know this is already there. This is purely for, this is purely for um, illustrative purposes. But here we have a stack of t, OK? And it's given me operations. I can push items onto the stack, and I can pop things off the stack. And I can say that I want a stack of t. Uh, so I could say I want a new stack of string, OK? I know, therefore, that it will only accept strings to push on. I know, therefore, it will only accept strings to pop off. OK? So generic classes are really where it's at. So you can do generic, you can declare, declare generic functions. Really, I, I would question why you would ever do that. OK? That, however, yes, makes perfect sense. Does every, everybody comfortable with generic, generic classes like this? It is pretty much exactly the same as you would expect. Um, and coming from its creator, you, you, it, it's the C-sharp syntax, effectively. So then again, it will do type inference in where it can. Um, but yes, it is pretty simple. Now, somebody asked me about namespaces. Modules, namespacing for JavaScript. Um, yes, uh, namespaces, as you know, JavaScript has no concept of namespaces, but there is the idea of hiding things away or grouping things together in, in, in named groups, yes? Um, so what ha often happens is you, you generate a variable, you have a variable, and you add things into that, uh, into that type, yes, that you can then refer to. Um, so yes, modules in, in TypeScript are exactly the same thing. Um, so here we go. Here is a module defined in TypeScript. Um, so the module has a number, which is 10. There's a foom function in there. There's a bar function in there. Right? And if I try and run, and this is what it will produce. 
by the way. So you can see that it produces, um, the, so the module was test. So it creates a function and then calls that function with a, either an existing test or a brand, so either an existing object array or a brand new object array and adds in the, the other uh, features required in the module. Okay? So it's nice and closed, it's, 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 it's safe, it will do everything you want it to do, except that, that doesn't work. Uh, except that's an error. Uh, and it will fail. Okay? The reason it, has, it will fail is because in a, in a module you need to export. So you need to tell it what it is you want to, the outside world to be able to see. Okay. So, somebody asked about, you asked about using underscore. There are, um, the, as, as I was saying, underscore itself as an output target isn't, isn't supported. However, the use of libraries that are external to TypeScript is. Now, it would be a very difficult world to exist in um, if you ha required absolutely everything that you're dealing with in TypeScript to be TypeScript. I mean, it would just be impossible. You wouldn't be able to get on, okay? There is a huge, huge ecosystem of support, of, of support libraries um, that make day-to-day -day JavaScript development work possible, okay? Not least of which being things like require or uh, jQuery or, or mustache or, uh, or any number of these different, uh, uh, Angular, uh, another very, very popular system. So there has to be a way of, um, uh, of being able to use external systems. So what, I'm, what I will do is I'm going to run through, um, I'm actually going to physically run through this scenario and I'm going to do some stuff in, in Visual Studio and I'll show you how this works. Um, this is worth making a note of, though. There is an open source project called Definitely Typed. And if you go to the Definitely Typed website, you will find pre-rolled type definitions that, um, are, that other people have already done to, that encapsulate most of the um, well-known um, uh, JavaScript libraries out there. Okay? And there, there is a huge number of them. But all the really big ones, they're already there. So Backbone's there, jQuery's there, Angular's there, you know, a uh, uh, requires there. They're all there. Okay? There is nothing to stop you writing your own. Type, the, the TypeScript uses what's called d.ts files, and I'll show you an example in a minute. But all a d.ts file is, is, a, is, is, a, is it's, a, <laughs> it's a declaration. So it allow, it's a way of TypeScript saying, look, this is, this is what the JavaScript target looks like. If, if this had been written in TypeScript, this is what the definitions would look like. Okay? And it means that you can then still consume the JavaScript targets, but without it being um, written up front that way. Okay? So, that much further ado. How much time have we got? Yes, 25 minutes. So, let's go to... Well, I haven't even got it running. Good Lord. Right. So I'm just simply going to create a brand, uh, um, simply going to create a new project. Da -da. Sorry, ultra fast machine. Every now and again, it decides it wants to think about everything for about half an hour. Here we go. So I'm going to make a, um, I'm just going to use an HTML application. I don't have any back-end stuff I want to do here. I just simply want to concentrate on the front-end, OK? So I'm just going to have an HTML application with TypeScript. Now, here we go. This will produce me a demo project. The demo project contains a TS file uh, and an index file to run it, OK? 
the index file runs the JavaScript file. So there, there is the, there's the TS file, so app.ts, but the index doesn't refer to that at all. It only refers to the JavaScript output. Okay? What this is going to do is this, ooh, really? Build errors? That's interesting. How on earth has it got a build error? <laughs> it's a brand new project. That is excellent. Well done, Microsoft. That is extraordinary. You know, of all the times I've run this demo, and it's worked every single time. Right, there we go. I've got a recent one. It would have to do it right now, wouldn't it? Yay! That's ah, bear with me a second. Let's just try this one more time. Right. What on earth is going on? Signed in. I have Numeric comparison was attempted on target platform version. Ha, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's, that's the, uh, yeah. <laughs> do you know I, I have I have never seen that before. I th I see it all the time when I do web support publishing. Really? Okay. How bizarre. Right, file, new, project. Hey. <sighs> Already exists, come on. Yeah, it's six. Creating projects. <sighs> it was going so well. <laughs> <laughs> so, build to start, build succeeded. Bingo. Hey, phew. Okay, so here we have a TypeScript HTML app. Uh, it's a demo app. What they've got is a um, a timestamp that's being updated in the browser. It is really, really simple stuff. So, what we have is a class greeter. The greeter takes an HTML element as its input and then continuously adds, uh, uh, continuously overwrites the contents of the element with the current time. Okay? It's really quite simple. Um, so there's the window on load that hooks, uh, hooks everything up. Now, just a quick aside, you'll notice that um, the type here um, is HTML element. Now, if I was to say that I have a var And I document dot create element, right? Now look at this. There's tag names here. And they all return different things. There is a way of defining in TypeScript that given um, different string inputs, you will get different item types back. So given an anchor being requested, the element, um, I don't know if you can see it, but there it says that it is an HTML anchor element. So the type that's coming back is of type anchor element. And so anything that's available to an anchor element will be visible to it. Anything that isn't available to an anchor element won't. OK? Right. So. Um, what I want to do is I want to use jQuery to do the update rather than using, um, the, uh, rather than just simply using a, a, um, a, 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 a get element by ID. I want to do this through, through jQuery because this is the way I've, all, everything else in my project works. Okay? So I'm just going to simply go to my console for a second and I'm going to add. Slightly bigger. There we go. So I'm going to just do an install. And this is where we hope that the 
<laughs> network working okay. Uh, so I'm going to install jQuery. It should work. Hey, there we go. So it's got me the jQuery package. I'm also going to install the jQuery TypeScript. Definitely types package. So the package, the, the site I was referring to just now, the definitely type site, they have a lot of the really popular um, packages. They've got the they've got the definitions already packaged up for you. So you just have to go and get them by NuGet. Now, if you look at the uh, the project, what you'll now find is there is a script file, the scripts folder that contains jQuery. There is also typings. And under typings, there's jQuery, and there's the jQuery d.ts, which is the, this is what it looks like. So this is just simply, here we go, here's the interface for jQuery AJAX settings. There are interfaces for jQuery static. That's effective with the dollar that you use in jQuery. All defined. OK. So they don't, there's no code here at all. It's just simply definitions. So that hold ready takes a pram to hold. That is a boolean. That is a boolean. Uh, fairly quickly. I mean, the, the, I mean, from what I've seen, the um, the community is very fast. I mean, truth be told, in a lot of cases when jQuery gets updated, it's not the signatures that get updated. Truth, be, uh, most of the time it's bug fixes. So in the case where where signatures don't get changed, well, there's nothing to change. Yeah? Um, but yeah, I mean, it took a while at the beginning. Sorry, the question for the camera, the question was how quickly do you think do the definitions get updated once first new versions of jQuery come out? Um, yeah, it, it depends is the honest answer. So the more popular applications will be up, updated much quicker than, uh, the, the, than the less popular ones. Things like jQuery get updated very quickly. OK? So what I can say is that I, if I pull in there, so I'm going to pull in a reference. And this reference points to the d.ts. OK? In my index, I'm going to pull in, uh, there's the JavaScript, so I'm going to pull that in. So I've got. A script source for jQuery. I've got, a script, I've got a script source for my application. In my TS file that's producing this, I have a reference path. And so this tells TypeScript where to find the definition. OK. Just another aside, I have got installed um, the excellent Web Essentials. Web Essentials provides side-by-side -side, um, compilation support for TypeScript. So as you compile in TypeScript on one side, it'll update the, the, the jQuery on the other side. OK? Um, it's rather nice. So you see there, there's the reference path that's now gone in to the, to the, uh, uh, as a comment. Yes? Sorry, if we have a. a ah, yes, sorry. Yes, no, you're absolutely right. Yes. Um, as, as rightly pointed out, yes, you do need to update two for TypeScript support to be embedded in Visual Studio. Um, I mean, the, 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 one of the points about TypeScript is TypeScript is not a Microsoft only technology. It really, really, really isn't. Um, it is Node. It is run through, it, it can be run through Node. In fact, you know, here is, if, if I just quickly bring up a virtual box, here is, um, da, 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 ignore that. Here is a fresh Ubuntu box that I, that I built um, a couple of hours ago because uh, I realized I didn't have one on my machine. So, if I want to get TypeScript running on here, I'll just quickly bring a terminal up. Um, all I need to do uh, is uh, apt-get install uh, 
Node.js. So that's Node.js. Now I've got Node.js installed, I should now be able to npm install globally TypeScript. Uh, oh, I'm going to need to sudo that. Isn't I? Oh. Of course, you need the Node Package Manager separately. That's what I mean. This is an absolutely vanilla, out of the box distribution. Nothing has been done to it, uh, apart from updating and getting the virtual box packages on there. So while that's going on, oh, there we go. Right, so uh, npm install TypeScript. Done. The TypeScript compiler should now be available somewhere. Have I not done it right? Uh, yes. Oh, it's TSC. I don't you just love it when a demo comes together? <laughs> ah! I'll come back on to that later. <laughs> ah! Generally, it works fine. Um, so, sorry, the point I was trying to make is that it is available under pretty much any environment. I have got it running. Yeah, sorry. Um, what is the support for TypeScript in other IDs other than TypeScript? Uh, so, the question is, what is the, uh, what is the support for TypeScript in other IDEs? Right. Um, IntelliJ supports it out of the box. Uh, Eclipse has support for, uh, for TypeScript. Um, there are bindings for Sublime. There are bindings for um, practically every major text editor I've seen so far. Um, there is support or either already baked in or coming. Uh, but the major ones that I use, yeah, all, ha all have it. Okay? Brilliant. Right, anyway, so uh, where were we? We were getting, we were, we've got 12 minutes. We were going to get um, jQuery into um, the, uh, in, into this project, yes? Okay, wonderful. So um, let's say that, as opposed to this, we're not going to say that we want uh, this constructor to work against an HTML element that's passed in. We're going to say that we're going to work against a selector, and we're going to pass it through to jQuery to do all the work. Okay? So let's say that the, uh, we'll change this to a selector, and we'll say that this is a string. Um, and what we'll say, in fact, is this is public, so I don't even have to worry about doing any of this. I can get rid of all of that. Um, in fact, I'll also get rid of the element. Uh, I just need the timer token, actually. Um, let's say that, that we do a, a show time method. And this is going to say, so dollar this. So notice, again, I've got dollar. And there's the, there's the IntelliSense that's come. And this is IntelliSense that has come, and it even says a jQuery in jQuery d.ts. So that is the jQuery static interface, and that provides me with this information. OK? Have got that for old versions of jQuery as well? You can, go to, you can get specific versions if you want. Uh, but I won't lie and, uh, and say that older versions will be as well supported as newer ones. OK? Right, so. <laughs> Somebody's got to. Um, right, so let's say this selector, and here we go. Here's all the. Here are the various methods that I can uh, the, that the uh, that it will give me. Um, there's HTML, um, and I'm simply going to say you know, the time is, and put a span in and say new date uh, to UTC now, or your two UTC string, there we go. Um, bosh, 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 and uh, where the hell did that come from? <laughs> it got a bit confused for a second, uh, as did I, span, close it off, right. 
hopefully that should be it. So uh, there we go. So I want to if I say show uh, this show time. There we go. And on my timer token, I'm going to take all of this out and simply replace it with show time. There we go. All right, we're happy with this so far. So here we go. I've now got an error, and it's telling me that the greeter shouldn't be given an HTML element at the moment because it actually needs, it wants a selector, wants a, wants a string. So uh, content. So I can get rid of that. Now, I've not been doing well for demos so far. So if this if this breaks, then hey, it worked. <laughs> Sorry. So we have um, TypeScript in a browser that is using um, jQuery. So it's referring to jQuery. The jQuery itself is being pulled is being defined by definitely typed by a d.ts file. Okay. That's not good enough. That's really not good enough. What I really want to do, and I'll see, see if we can get this done in time. Uh, so what I want to do is I actually want to do this via uh, a module. OK, so I, want, so I want module support. Now, one of the really good things with, um, with, with TypeScript is that it, it makes using things like CommonJS or it makes using um, uh, other module loaded uh, or require.js really, really easy to do. Okay, first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to install a package and I'm going to do use require. While that's doing, I'm going to go to the properties for the project and I'm going to change the TypeScript build to say that from module system to none to AMD, which is which is the require subsystem. Okay, and I'm also going to get the TypeScript definitions for this. So require.js TypeScript. Again, I can't type. Definitely typed. There we go. Now, here we go. I've got a require.js. So I'm going to go as fast as I physically can. I have a require.js. Um, I have the jQuery bindings. I have require.js bindings there as well. So, in my index, I'm going to get rid of both of these. And I'm going to say that um, I'm going to pull in require. Uh, and I'm going to say that my data main. And I'm going to call, I'm going to ask, say this is config. Now, um, what this is going to do is this is going to try and run a JavaScript file. Now, I don't have this JavaScript file yet. I don't have, config doesn't exist. So I'm going to create it. Although I'm not going to create JavaScript, I'm going to create TypeScript. So here it is, config. And I'm going to say that my require config, who has used require.js? Yeah? OK. So you know it could be a bit of a faff to set up. OK. Well, TypeScript already knows what the definitions are, because I've pulled it in, and IntelliSense is clever enough to work this out. Um, so the, there are various members on this, and one of them is paths. So I'm going to put paths, and I'm going to say that my path for jQuery, if this works first time, I will be absolutely amazed. Scripts, uh, jQuery. 2.1.1. OK. And I, what I want to do now is I want to require, sorry, I don't want to require, I want to import. Do I want to require import? Ah, I can't remember. Bar oh, app. So it's require. Like that. So this produces pretty much exactly the same JavaScript. So there's my require config. What this is going to say is anytime anybody asks for jQuery as an object or as a module, that's where you go and get it. OK, it's going to, it's going to instantiate it and it's going to get it in place. Uh, so I'm now going to go back to my app. I'm going to take this uh, so I'm going to take the reference out. I don't need this. I'm going to take the class out. And I'm going to make a new 
file, add TypeScript file. I'll call this greeter. Bosh. Now, watch what happens when I change this from class greeter to export class greeter and save it. I saw an oo over there. It's done it for me. So there is the require. There's, there's the exports. Now, what I need is I need the dollar to be accessible, right, so that that will work, right? So what I, what I do is say that var dollar is equal to import. Sorry, let's chase that again. Import dollar is equal to require. Uh, I can't type jQuery. And now look what it's done. There is the jQuery import. And if you scroll over, although it's not going to let me now, it's not going to let me. Um, if I was to scroll over, you would see that the function, it, 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 the dollar is defined in there. So dollar is now being provided for me by require. So require should go off and get, get should, get, should go off and get that for me. Now, uh, as I say, if this works completely first time, I will be over the moon. And we've got a couple of minutes. <laughs> right. So let's have a look. That's going to go to config. Config is going to instantiate that. Uh, I now don't want this. I now simply want to say there. And of course, oh, yes. Right, so I want to say that I now need a way of getting hold of greeter because greeter itself is a module. So import g is equal to require greeter. And what we should find is that becomes g.greeter. And there we go. Now, as I say, if this works, I will be over the moon. Yay! And there we go. So, just in case you missed this, what we've got is a sample TypeScript project that is pulling in resources from, um, uh, so modules, so pulling in jQuery as a module, and it is type safe. So I have all the type inference. I know what I know what dollar does. I know what my own greeter class does, because if I go back to the code, okay, greeter is in a different module. It's in a different file to the one I'm, the one I'm working in here. But if I was to turn around and say I want a greeter and I want a greeter against the number ten, that is not going to work, because that doesn't match the definitions. Okay. So, um, build integration, as you'd probably expect, there's quite a lot of integration with Microsoft existing Microsoft technologies, so MS Build. Um, there, is a, there is a targets file that is, pro that is provided by Visual Studio, uh, so that's Microsoft TypeScript for targets. There are, uh, there are in fact, other um, packages, projects you'll find in NuGet that allow you to disconnect from that, because that Obviously, the problem is if you're in a CI environment, you don't really want Visual Studio installed, and sometimes the type uh, and the targets files don't follow you. Um, Grunt, a huge, huge move, move to Grunt these days. The biggest project I'm working with at the moment uses Grunt, and in the project that I'm doing, uh, uh, the build process, all our TypeScript files are being built using Grunt TypeScript. Okay. It just becomes part of, the pro part of the build process. It's in the same way that we're doing all our less to CSS, our SAS to CSS conversions. We're doing our TypeScript ones at the same time. And that sounds way. There are co um, so just very quickly, common misconceptions. Can, you only be used to, can only be used for .NET projects? Not true. It is completely platform agnostic. And if I, my demo hadn't failed because I hadn't prepared it, well enough in Ubuntu, it would have worked. Um, honestly, uh, the, as I say, the largest project I'm working on at the moment is not even a .NET project, it's a Java project. 
um, and it just happens to be uh, one of our building build targets happens to have TypeScript. There is, there is no reliance on any proprietary Microsoft technology at this point. Um, requires another browser runtime? No, there are no runtime is required at all. It simply produces JavaScript. There is, there is no browser requirements at all beyond it will run JavaScript. Okay? Um, and that it's difficult to work with existing code and libraries. No, most existing JavaScript investments can be used as is. For most major projects, that are most major libraries out there, you will find a shim already done for you. Definitely types is a fantastic resource, as, a, as there are others. But it's not hard to write your own either. I mean, in most cases, if you've got, if you've got small, small projects, you can write, you can knock up um, a, t a type definition you know, in, in, a ver in very short order. In fact, in most cases, you only knock up the definitions of the bits of the projects or the libraries that you're accessing at a time. And you simply incrementally add support into your, D, into your own local D.TS as you require. Advantages, well, we found personally with large projects where you have a large number of developers, and especially a large number of developers working within uh, the JavaScript layer, you have all the same problems that you do behind the browser, you know, uh, uh, in, in, your, in, in, your JavaScript, in your JavaScript, your Java stack, or your .NET stack, or anything else. All right, it's being able to say, look, I've got a fairly good idea that what's being passed around is of a similar size, and so two developers could be working on independent sections of code, without much, without worrying about about the shape of information coming across, um, and external libraries. So yes, they can help provide intelligence for development, for example. So you saw the intelligence coming up for for jQuery. Um, I could just as easily do that with other things. And as I say, it does prov um, things like um, IntelliJ use TypeScript where it's there to provide, uh, to provide IntelliSense. OK? And that's basically it. So thank you for your time. I realize we just, just slightly run over. Um, if anybody wants to grab me afterwards for uh, any brief questions, you're more than welcome. But uh, apart from that, Please, oh, before you go on, um, please have a look at the, um, there's, the, 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 the there's the app for the, um, uh, for, for the event. Uh, if, you could, if you wouldn't mind putting a racing, I'd be very grateful. Um, but apart from that, please enjoy the rest of the conference. Uh, go and have a coffee, and I'll see you tomorrow.